Many emergency medical care providers um, are concerned about the possibility of a lawsuit uh, resulting from their actions while providing emergency care. Um, basically, while there's nothing to stop a patient or a patient's family from filing a lawsuit against you um, for providing care at the scene of an emergency, there are definitely um, defenses and immunities that can be asserted. So the big deal is that by becoming aware of some of the basic legal principles involved in providing emergency assistance, that you would be able to reduce the chances um, of a successful lawsuit. So the the purpose of this lecture um, on legal and ethical issues is just to make you aware of your rights as an emergency responder. So the first term we come to is is the scope of, of practice, right? Um, and we could define that basically as a range of duties and skills that the emergency medical responder is allowed and expected to perform in an emergency situation when dealing with a patient. Um, the scope of practice also defines boundaries and or distinctions within the healthcare system, right? And this is done to really ensure that each level of provider operates within a legally acceptable range of duties and skills. Um, so the scope of practice ideally would draw a distinction between the professionals at the emergency scene um, and the layperson, so the citizen responder who doesn't really have any skills or training whatsoever. Um, the emergency responder, just like any other out-of-hospital care provider, um, is governed by legal and ethical and medical guidelines. So uh, because each practice may differ from state to state um, or in regions of the same state, it is important that you as a first responder become aware of the variations existing for your level of training within your specific state. So we're in the state of California, so it would be important at this point in time to go ahead and Google the state laws for an emergency responder or a first responder so that you know what your scope of practice is. Um, I will end with this slide and just say that the term scope of practice may also refer to the authority to practice. So your ability to practice within a given state and to provide treatment to individuals who might need care in an emergency situation. So on the opposite end of that spectrum is the standard of care. Um, and the standard of care and the scope of practice tend to get mixed up in terms of in terms of the definition. However, the standard of care is a little bit different because the standard of care represents what the public what the public's expectation is of you as a first responder. So what we would say is that the standard of care truly is this criterion established for the extent, not only the extent, but also the quality of care that the emergency responder provides during an emergency situation. Um, so we could look at this and say, when providing emergency care, what we would say is that emergency medical responders are expected to perform to at least the minimum standard set forth by their training, the minimum standard. Um, and so we would look at this and we would say, well, state laws and other authorities such as national organizations may govern the actions of emergency responders. So another way to look at the standard of care is really the list of rules and regulations that allow you to do what it is that you are going to do um, at the emergency scene. Um, if your actions do not meet the standards, so if you deviate outside of your skills um, and you harm another person, then you may successfully be sued for negligence um, and or malpractice. So then there's this idea of the duty to act, right? And so we think about duty to act. What that really represents is exactly what it says, is that while you're on duty, while you are working as a, an emergency first responder, you have an obligation to respond to an emergency and provide care at that scene. Um, and this obligation obviously is called the duty to act. It applies to not only you as first responders, but also safety officers, such as police officers, um, certain government officials, um, that uh, licensed and certified professionals. So, for example, um, uh, physical therapists, uh, certified athletic trainers would be in under that umbrella. Um, and then also medical paraprofessionals. So a physician's assistant would be an example of that. A physician would be an, an example of that. Um, a registered nurse or a doctor, a doctorate of nurse practitioner. All of these individuals have a duty to act while they are within the construct um, of their specific profession and they are on duty. So um, I think it's important that to learn is that, okay, the duty to act represents this idea that you are going to respond when you are working. But when we look at um, 
this PowerPoint slide and we start to take a, a deep look at what we're thinking about, one of the big deals is this idea that while you're on duty, right? And so what happens when you're off duty and you see an emergency situation occur? Well, this comes down to moral um, versus your legal duties, right? We think about something that's a legal duty. We think we have to do it because we're being paid to do it or we're working, so we have to do it. However, there are going to be times where you're driving by on a freeway, you notice a car crash and you're headed home. Um, the question becomes, do you you stop and help out at the scene that becomes more of a moral obligation right you are not legally liable you're not uh, responsible for stopping but you know if you had to ask me more than likely I probably would stop um, to help and so um, one the big deal with stopping when you're off duty and helping is that once you have begun to provide care then you are legally obligated to continue until the patient is turned over to someone with equal um, and or higher level training. So that would be either an, another first responder comes to the scene um, or your EMTs slash paramedics arrive and they are getting ready to transport your patient. So again, if we are on duty, if we are getting paid to perform a task, we have a duty to act. However, there are going to be life situations where we are not working, where we are not on the clock, and we are going to be um, asked to respond. Um, and then that goes back to your moral obligation, right? You, when you go to sleep at night, um, you will be able to think whether or not you should have helped um, a person or a patient when you could have. So one of the things to take into consideration is um, whether or not your patient is competent, right? And so we will define competence as the patient's ability to understand the questions that you are asking and then to understand the implications for the decisions that are being made either for them or that the decisions that they may have to make in regards to their treatment, right? Um, and so one of the biggest things, one of the biggest deals for emergency responders really is obtaining permission from a competent patient before beginning or providing any care. If you were to touch a patient without asking them first if you could help them, sometimes that could be considered battery and or assault. So the rule of thumb is always to identify yourself as a first responder and then to ask if it is okay to treat that given patient. So an example of that would be, my name is Nicole Cosby, I'm a first responder, I'm skilled or trained in dot dot dot, can I please help you? That patient, if they are competent, then has the, the right, the given right to say yes or no or to refuse care, right? And so what we're really talking about is that patient has the right to either say to give consent or to refuse care, right? Um, if they refuse care, then you just have to determine whether or not they are competent enough to refuse care. Now, there are certain cases, such as those that involve intoxication, um, whether that be drug abuse um, or some type of cognitive impairment, such as a patient with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, where the patient is not considered competent. Um, and then you have other uh, scenarios, such as individuals that are minors who are not competent to make decisions about their care um, as a matter of law. Um, in any of those given cases, you call 911 um, or advanced medical care and law enforcement personnel and, um, and then you wait for them to arrive to provide the, the, the appropriate treatment, okay? So if we were to recap this, we would say that if a patient isn't competent, so we say someone who isn't competent is someone who's intoxicated, um, they somehow abused or used some type of drug, or they have a, uh, some type of cognitive impairment, or if we're dealing with a minor, in those cases we tend not to treat those patients, we call 911 right away and allow 911 um, to provide the appropriate treatment. So getting the patient's consent, remember, they must be competent in order to give their consent. Um, basic law states that individuals have a basic right to decide what can and cannot be done to their bodies. Um, they have the legal right to accept or refuse care as long as they are competent. So um, therefore, it is important to that to provide care to an injured or Ill, Ill person, you must first obtain the patient's consent, right? And so usually the patient needs to tell you clearly that you have permission to provide care. To obtain consent, there are several different things that a first responder must do. The first thing is you must identify yourself to the patient. The next thing is that you must give your level of training. 
Uh, I think the next step would be to explain what you observe. So I see blood coming from your arm. I see that you have a bone protruding through your leg. And then explain what you're going to do. I'm going to splint that bone. I'm going to put some gauze over that bleed. You're walking your patient through what it is that you're going to do. And then I think one thing that is really missing on this PowerPoint slide that is hugely important is to ask the patient whether or not you can actually help them, right? And so this is all about the must get consent. You're going to ask your patient, can I help you? Ask. Okay, can I help you? If they say yes, then you move forward with your treatment. And if they say no, then you stop your treatment and you call 911 and you just try to keep them as stable as possible without providing care. So we've been talking about consent, um, and this is the person's legal right to decide whether or not they want you to help um, treat them, right? Or the, their legal right to decide what can and cannot be done to their bodies. Um, but I think we really need to define consent a little bit further, right? There are two different types of consent. There's express consent, um, and then there's implied consent. So we'll first start off with express consent, because I think that's the most common of them all. Express consent really represents um, the the idea that the patient can either verbally or through gesture tell you that it's okay for you to treat them right so when we think of express or someone expressing themselves it really represents their ability to verbally tell you or through some type of gesture let you know that it is okay to treat them um, if the patient is a minor the law requires that the emergency medical responder obtain consent from a parent and or a guardian if one is available um, please keep in mind that the patient has the right to withdraw consent for care at any time. If this should occur, for whatever reason, just go ahead and step back and call for more advanced medical personnel. One big rule applies to express consent. In order for a patient to give express consent, they must be competent, okay? If they are not competent, which we'll talk about, then you have to step away and call for more advanced medical care, okay? So what does competent mean? Remember, it means that the patient must be able to understand your questions as well as the implications for accepting or refusing any care that you have proposed, right? Um, the, EM, the emergency medical responder should always ensure that the patient understands the condition and both the risk and benefits of the, the proposed treatment. That is your number one role. On the opposite end of the spectrum, what we also have is um, this type of consent called implied consent, right? Which occurs sometimes, um, often in emergency situations. So with implied consent, um, what, what we would say is that the patient um, would allow us to treat them if they were competent or if they were conscious, right? So for example, um, if you encounter a patient who refuses to allow you to provide care, you're going to try to explain the consequences of not caring for the patient. Um, and then if they continue to uh, not allow you to treat them, then we're going to call 911. But what happens if you have an unconscious patient who's lying on the ground, you tap them, you shout, are you okay? Are you okay? They don't respond and they're unconscious, then at this point you can assume that you would have the patient's implied consent, that in fact if they were conscious they would want you to help them, right? Um, and in this case we go ahead and we provide treatment. Um, remember, when the patient is a minor, um, the big deal with the emergency medical responder is that you are required by law to obtain permission um, to provide care from a parent or a guardian if one is available. However, if the, pa the parent is uh, not available and it is a life-threatening condition, then you um, implied consent is applied and you can treat that patient. However, you need to know the laws for each state. So one of the biggest obstacles to treating minors really um, are their parents, right? You guys, you guys aren't minors, but you have parents. Parents tend to be um, overprotective in nature. So you know, what are you going to do if you encounter a patient who refuses to allow you to provide care? Um, the big deal is really just trying to explain the consequences of not caring for the patient. Um, you're always going to use terms that the parent and guardian will understand. Um, I refer to these as lay terms. So instead of a broken tibia, you're going to say, you know, he has a broken leg. Instead of using terms like fracture or strain or sprain, you would say something like broken or torn. Um, if, if a law enforcement um, officer is not present, then you're going to send someone to call or fine. Um, if necessary, um, if the patient, if the parent won't let you provide treatment, maybe you could use the parent to provide treatment for you, right? Um, one of the biggest things on this slide 
is this idea of religious beliefs. Um, I think this is a huge one, especially when we're dealing with like your um, your Seventh Day Adventists um, um, patients um, or your patients who do not believe in getting, um, let's say, blood transfusions or getting treatment from um, from emergency responders of the opposite sex. So it's important to know um, sometimes the religion of your patient, which will help you also um, understand your uh, what you can and cannot do in terms of providing treatment for for that patient. So what happens if you if you know the child? Well, uh, the recommendation is truly to to pass on care because sometimes if you know the child, then it might be too emotional for you as a first responder. If you don't think that it's going to be emotional, then go ahead and try to provide care as much as possible. Once again, with a minor, we have to have the parents' permission to provide care. The only time that we do not have to have the parents permission is if they are unconscious and it would be implied that the parent would want us to help them. So this brings us to a touchy topic of advanced directives and do not resuscitate orders. Um, when, you, when we think about an advanced directive, that's a set of written instructions um, that describes a person's wishes, right, or a patient's wish, wishes about medical care. Um, these instructions are signed by the patient and the physician um, and make a person's person's intentions known while he or she is still capable of doing so and are used when the patient can no longer make his or her own health care decisions, right? So i.e. a life-threatening uh, situation where the patient is unconscious and can't communicate um, their their treatment decisions. Um, on the opposite end of that, we, have, we also have do not resuscitate orders. Um, and so when we think about a do not resuscitate order, there are several different types. Um, one type is called a do not attempt resuscitation or a DNAR. Um, and this basically protects a patient's right to refuse efforts for resuscitation. So if we have an unconscious elderly patient who's wearing a do not attempt resuscitation um, and we suspect that they are in cardiac arrest and we want to perform CPR, we are not allowed to do this. Um, these orders are usually written for people who have a terminal illness. Um, and as you can see on um, this page right here, um, it's, it's truly um, the idea that this patient would probably be wearing some type of bracelet um, or be carrying some type of paper or even have it tattooed on them, right? And this would help us when we're uh, um, trying to figure out what type of treatment um, to provide to this patient. So rule of thumb when you're working with elderly patients is truly to scan their body to see if in fact they are wearing a do not resuscitate orders. Um, DNRs or do not resuscitate orders differ from state to state. So again, it's important that you know your state laws. Um, and the, the best place to look for this would be your, your, your state um, emergency medical services office. Um, I'm pretty sure you could also use Google um, to, to find that as well. You know, one of the biggest moral dilemmas is, you know, when in doubt, when you are unsure of the written orders, go ahead and resuscitate. Um, it's better to resuscitate um, than to be unsure and have a patient dead. So when you deal with the DNR, if you're unsure whether or not the paperwork, so the paperwork that they have um, is, is real or legal, if you are unsure if the tattoo that they have um, is just a, a tattoo that they decided to get, go ahead and try to resuscitate your patient and then worry about the fallout later. So um, this brings us to pretty much the conclusion of, of the legal issues. Um, but the big one is refusal of care. I think as a first responder, um, as athletic training majors, as healthcare professionals, our big deal is that we want to care for our patients. However, we may have those patients who refuse um, to allow us to provide care. Um, and it may be that they even desperately need it, but they have a legal right if they are competent to refuse our care. Um, so what I will say is that patients with a decision-making capacity who are of legal age have the, ref the right to refuse care. Um, and in, if this does occur in a situation that you encounter, you must ensure um, that your patient is competent and is able to make rational, informed decisions. If this is the case, then here's what I'm going to tell you to do. The first thing is to follow your local policies um, as it relates to refusal of care. Um, you're going to try to tell the patient what treatment is needed and why, and even maybe have um, the patient provide his or her own care if it's possible. Um, you're going to try to convince the patient um, that care is needed and what type of care you're going to give them, but if they still refuse, um, you're going to have a witness, if possible, listen to and document the refusal of care. 
Um, and then last but not least, it's really just a reminder to your injured and ill persons um, that they can call emergency medical services, um, that they can call 911, that you can call 911, that you can just sit there and wait for advanced medical care to arrive. Um, the big deal is um, this abandonment issue, right? So that even if a patient does refuse our care, we are in no way supposed to leave them until EMS arrives. And here's why. You could be sued. You could be held liable for abandoning your patient. So never, ever leave the scene until someone with equal or higher training comes to relieve you, right? Um, and I've had several situations more racially, racially generated where it just happened that a, a person did not want me to help them because I was African American. And I was totally okay with that. I called 911. They came. They helped the patient. And I didn't leave the scene until after the um, ambulance left. So um, if it's possible, you want to draw up some type of form um, and have the patient sign it and then also the witness sign it. So that relieves you um, of any legal liability, right? Patient and then the witness as well. And keep it for about seven years or so. Um, so there's there's battery and I, I always laugh when I get to this slide because it seems like something that will never happen but um, so let's define battery right so that we would define it as a legal term that is used to describe the unlawful touching of a person without um, a person's consent right and so we can think about how many patients we're going to interact with on a daily basis the big deal you guys is to make sure that you are getting your patients permission before you touch them because by the definition of battery if you were to touch a patient before you got their consent, you could be sued for battery. So my rule of thumb is always, 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 always try to make sure that you are getting your patient's consent, right? Always get their patient consent before you touch your patient to avoid battery charges. Remember, your patient has the legal right to choose, right? They can refuse care if they want to, or they could allow you to treat them. It's truly up to your patient as long as they are competent, right? Um, so... If your patient is threatening physical harm to you as a first responder, then the big deal is to back away from the scene, to call 911, and to let advanced medical personnel deal with your patient. So then there's abandonment, which we talked about when a patient refuses care, but let's just describe uh, abandonment. So it's basically once you've gotten patient's consent and you've provided, you started to provide care, you must continue your care once it has begun. Um, you have a legal obligation to do this um, until either one of three things happens. A person of equal or higher training arrives, so that would be your paramedics, your EMTs, a physician. Um, you are physically unable to continue. And so when we talk about performing CPR, that is a physically tiring task. And so you might just be t too tired to perform the skill. So in that case, you could stop care once it's begun. Or if your patient decides mid-care to refuse care, then you can go ahead and stop. Otherwise, if you stop care once it's begun um, without any of these three reasons, then you could be considered or held liable for abandonment. So when does your legal obligation for care end? It truly doesn't end until the ambulance or higher level training arrives and carts or takes your patient away. Until that happens, you are to stay at the scene. EMS, um, emergency medical services, so advanced medical care might have some questions, follow-up questions for you. So it's always important to let people leave the scene before you leave the scene. You're safe if you leave the scene and it's empty. You are unsafe and can be sued for abandonment if the scene is still filled with medical personnel who might need your help. So I've talked about all these legal terms, and the biggest legal term of them all is probably negligence, right? And so we, when we define negligence, we would say it's uh, failure to follow a reasonably a reasonable standard of care, right? We've already defined standard of care um, at the beginning of this lecture. So when you uh, fail to follow this reasonable standard of care, what you do or what happens is you either cause or you contribute to um, the injury or damage to another person, right? So let's look at it this way. You have a patient who's already injured. You either make that injury worse um, by doing something or you do something that's outside of your skill level and by doing so your patient dies, right? And so we could say that you could be held negligent, right? When we think about negligence, negligence could be um, your, um, could occur by either acting or by not acting at all or failing to act. And so what we have are two types of negligence. Um, we have 
omission and commission, right? We think about omission. What this means is you failed to act when you should have. You were on duty and you did not act. Because you did not act, your patient died. On the opposite end of that spectrum, we have um, what we would call commission, right? And commission means you acted, but you acted outside of the scope of your practice. And because you did something you were not trained to do, then you and you cause further harm, you become negligent that way. So negligent can occur by failing to act, or it could occur by acting outside of the scope of your practice. So in order to be sued for negligence, um, there are four elements of negligence that have to be present. You have to have all four, or the patient has to have all four of these occur in order for you to be sued and to be held liable. The first one is duty. You had a duty to act, and you, you either failed to act or you acted outside of the scope of your practice. Because you acted outside of the scope of your practice, you breached your duty, meaning meaning that um, you acted, it was outside of the scope of your practice, or you didn't act, and because of that, you breached. That breach of your duty caused some type of damage. It might have been more injury, it might have been a patient dying, doesn't really have to be specific, but all four of these elements have to be present in order for a person to be held or a first responder to be held liable. Now, here's the deal with negligence. It is typically very hard to for a patient to win a negligent case because typically they have a hard time proving all four facets of negligence. My rule of thumb is just to make sure that when you are when you have a duty to act that you act and when you act you act within the scope of your practice and that you avoid causing any type of harm to your patient. If you always do that, then you can never be held liable or be uh be negligent in your in your treatment of your patient. So the good thing about being a, a first responder is this, uh, this law called the Good Samaritan Law. Um, and basically it was instated uh, within most states to protect um, first responders or emergency medical responders who were responding to emer an emergency, were acting in good faith, um, were not negligent, um, and were acting within the scope of their practice. Um, if you're always doing this, whether you're on duty or off duty, we what the law says is that you are a good Samaritan. You are a person who was trying to help um, an individual in an emergency situation, and you cannot be held liable for your actions. Again, as long as you're acting within the scope of your training, you are not negligent, and you're acting in good faith. So within our interactions with our patients, one big deal to keep in mind is confidentiality. Um, as a first responder, it is important that any information that you get from the victim while you are providing care should not be shared. It should not be shared with um, any of the patient's friends. It should not be shared with uh, any of the patient's family. Um, and this could include but not be limited to um, medical problems that they had in the past, any physical problems that they had, um, any medications that they, they might currently be be taken right now of course with that being said there are exceptions to every rule um, and that exception is when it involves some type of physical abuse or some type of sexual assault it is then that you are more than welcome to um, discuss and to call um, appropriate care if that is the case if you are not dealing with a patient who has been sexually abused or sexually assaulted then patient confidentiality trumps anything else now, I said be confidential. However, you're in the athletic training setting, you're going to have um, athletes who come up and say, oh, what happened to that, that person or what, what did he do, right? And so there's this thing called confidentiality versus common knowledge. So what is considered to be common knowledge? Let's say you have a soccer athlete who goes down on the field and, and rolls her ankle and he fractures, let's say, his fibula, right? Well, an athlete could come up to you and say, what happened to him? And you can say, oh, well, he hurt his ankle. Well, why is that common knowledge? Because everyone saw that something happened to his ankle. What you cannot say is that he has a fractured fibula and is going to be out for four to six weeks. So there's this thing of being confidential with the patient's information, but at the same time, you can provide some common knowledge just to reduce the stressors um, at the actual event itself. So this concludes um, chapter three, which is legal and ethical issues. Um, my hopes is, is that you would go through the chapter within your text to um, 
add to the knowledge that I provided here. Um, this is only one construct of what we do as first responders. However, it is a huge proponent and component of what we need to know as first responders. I think it's hugely important to know your state regulations. So um, for homework for the next class period, what I want you to do in is bring in the legal responsibilities for a first responder in the state of California. Um, I hope you have a good night and I'll see you tomorrow.